Welcome to the first of the Reading as Detection videos, part of the core course of the third year Literature and Publishing at the University of Greenwich. My name is Professor Andrew King. I've posted on YouTube a series of videos that I hope will help you get as much as possible from the course. That said, the videos are also available to audiences beyond the university. It seems from the many thousands of views already that people from all over the world have found them useful. The videos aren't intended as substitutes for the lectures and seminars, the in-person ones, but they are designed to work with them. They're the equivalent of the secondary reading we used to be enjoined to do 40 plus years ago when I was an undergraduate. You could pass without reading the critics, but it was unlikely that you'd do superbly well. So it is with these YouTube videos. The videos are much more detailed than any live in-room lecture ever could be. I've designed them to take advantage of the online format. You can stop them to take notes whenever you want. You can listen at a slower or faster speed to suit you. You can re-listen, uh, look again. You can switch the captions on and off as you need or want to. And there are lots of other advantages of on-demand learning. The in-room sessions are much more interactive. We all know after the pandemic how very valuable it is just to be able to interact with someone in a room. We can be lectured at much more effectively online where we can remain in control of how and when we listen. In the classroom, on the other hand, we can test our knowledge. We can exchange views with friends and with the teacher and so on in communicative ways we can't or just don't do online. And it's the combination of the online and the in-room that I think is unusually valuable about this course. It's called the flipped classroom method and it's quite common today across the world. So how do you find the rest of the videos? Well, if you're a Greenwich student, you'll find links to each individual one on your Moodle page for literature and publishing. But it's just as simple to search for Greenwich detective fiction videos on a search engine and then select the video you're interested in. Of course, you could also subscribe to this channel. That's even easier. Okay, so that's the very general address. Now let's get a bit more specific. In fact, this whole video is organized like a funnel. Uh, we start off very general indeed. and At the end, we'll just be looking at a couple of words. Now this series of videos is called Reading as Detection. And the channel on which the video is, is called Greenwich Detective Fiction. Well, why? Well, it's my contention that what a detective does as traditionally depicted in fiction and what we as readers do are very, very closely related. Basically, reading and detection both rely on the identification and interpretation of clues, letters, words, sentences, paragraphs, chapters and so on for a reader, letters on a bloodstained scarf, newspaper reports, medical records, code left in a Bible, and so on and so forth for a fictional detective. In one novel we'll read, an account of a therapy session means something very different to the reader than it does to the therapist, because we readers are in possessions of clues that the therapist does not have. Now, this part of the course and these videos center on detective fiction precisely because detectives can be understood as figures for the reader. Reading about detectives reveals to us how we read. And how we read, of course, is absolutely at the core of what English literature is. That's really important here. So, it may be that what detective fiction is, is not just a fiction about crime. It's not just crime fiction. 
because it may be that the detective finds out that the suspect hasn't committed a crime at all. We'll see that in the Sherlock Holmes, for example. It may be that we as readers are the detective, and that's certainly the case in several of the set texts. The problems are, how do we as readers decode the information we're given? Detectives, in fact, especially police detectives, are usually pretty hopeless in the set texts. Just think of the first two sets of police detectives, if you've read them, in the Edgar Allan Poe and in the Lupin story of the Red Silk Scarf. Police detectives can even be depicted as corrupt, and so corrupt, they undermine patriotic war efforts, as we'll see in The Lady in the Lake. Detective fiction, as I define it here then, is a fiction about people who try to detect reality from a series of clues. Whether those people are us readers, official detectives, or unofficial ones like Dupin in the Edgar Allan Poe. Now that leads me on to the next question. What is the fiction of detection? I've just said that detectives and readers hunt for clues about what really happened. And the genre of detective fiction relies on the solving of mysteries at the end. Problems are solved, crimes are uncovered and appropriately punished. Society, as is usually explained, society is purified and restored to balance. We like that idea. It implies that reality is graspable controllable. It's what detective fiction is very often said to do, especially golden age detective fiction, in fact, like Agatha Christie. Now, it's not like that in real life, of course, as real life is much more complicated than any fictional world. We know that, but we like the fantasy of being in control. As we find out, it very often doesn't happen quite as neatly as that in the fiction either, though. The novel may be finished and the characters or even the narrator will say the case is solved. But if we read suspiciously, like a detective, like a serious detective, we'll find that so often the clues are ambiguous. Maybe we readers, like the detectives we read about, become convinced we know what reality is, what really happened, that we've solved the crime. But so often the case just isn't that simple. There may be contradictory evidence that we prefer to ignore. For example, we only have Marlowe's conclusions in The Lady in the Lake. It's quite possible from the evidence we're given that some other solution is possible. We think what he concludes must be real because his story follows a very familiar logic. And something that inspired heated debate among students, what does the ending of P.D. James's an unsuitable job for a woman really mean? That women are not suited for detective work? Or that they really are? Or something else again? Yes, we do try to detect, we do try to decode, we do try to uncover reality, but we also have to admit that often we fail, that our detection, our successful detection, is a fiction to ourselves, a reassuring fiction that we tell ourselves and others in order to secure ourselves a place in the world. But admitting that our reading efforts, our detective efforts, are fictional is an important lesson in humility. And it's only then, in a humble state before the mystery of reality, the ungraspable nature of reality, that perhaps we can start to encounter rather than grasp what we seek. Now, I don't know about you, but how often have I firmly believed something and found all sorts of evidence to support me in that belief, only to find out in the end that I'm wrong, that I've been following somebody else's story, somebody else's logic, and coming to conclusions based on somebody else's fiction. 
I haven't actually encountered that person or that event. Admitting, truly admitting, that detection almost always has a fictional element to it is to me of profound ethical importance. And that's why you'll often find me giving contrary evidence in what follows. Knowing that we might be wrong doesn't mean that we shouldn't look for evidence. It doesn't mean that anything goes or that nothing matters. I mean, how would you feel if I define the whole of reality of who you are in just a few words at random based on no evidence? Not very good, eh? Huh? I bet you'd be angry. I hope you would. But rather, admitting that we are not in charge of the complete reality, that we can't solve the case, that we don't know the full meaning, means that we have to keep on trying. It's not the destination of them that matters, but the journey. It's the process of reading, the process of finding clues and assembling them into a story about reality. Isn't trying to do that honestly important? Well, it is to me. Finally, why does detective reading matter? Why does detection matter? Just to uphold the law or the status quo? Well, hardly. We'll certainly find out that that's really not the case. Reading like a detective means being suspicious at all times. It's, as I said, the core skill of studying English. You've already done a lot of it. And in this part of your core final year course, I'm highlighting that core skill by asking you to read suspiciously about reading suspiciously. That is, reading how literature has depicted detectives and encourages readers to detect in turn. For all these reasons, then, this part of the course is called Reading as Detection. And the channel where you can find the set of videos is called Greenwich Detective Fiction because even the focus is not really on detective fiction as a genre. Hmm. Why do you think the channel is called Greenwich Detective Fiction? Time for you to do some deduction. The three questions I've just explored underlie the whole course and the series of videos at a very deep level. I won't always return to them explicitly in the videos that follow, but they do motivate everything I say, from the detailed exploration of newspaper reports for murder that may have inspired elements of Mary Braddon's Henry Dunbar, to the reasons why Richard Marsh has his heroine detective left on the coast of Morocco, or why we're reading Lemon by Kwon Yo Sun on this course. Before we go any further, though, I guess I should give you a list of what texts we're covering. <laughs> These are they. I shan't read them out as such. Suffice it to say, they go all the way from the very beginnings of detective fiction and the mass market for reading, Edgar Allan Poe's The Murders in the Rue Morgue in 1841, to the 2021 translation of a short Korean novel originally published in 2019, Lemon, by, as I've just said, Kwon Yo Sun. We have representatives of Victorian sensation fiction with Mary Braddon's Henry Dunbar. You'll discover that the idea of sensation is very important to this whole part of the course, not just Victorian fiction. Then, naturally, we've got a Sherlock Holmes tale, a stunning Agatha Christie where the reader is in many ways the victim. Yes, you reader is a victim. Uh, Agatha Christie represents the golden age of detective fiction before we have an even more dazzling example, in stylistic terms anyway, of a reaction to the golden age, the hard-boiled. This is Raymond Chandler's wartime novel, The Lady in the Lake. We'll jump to the 1970s for P.D. James's provocative exploration of women in the workplace before finishing up with the Kwon Yo Sun. Now, in Greenwich Detective Fiction, the channel, you'll find videos on other texts too. And I confess, I haven't yet finished making all the videos, but I will, I promise. 
And if you subscribe, of course, you'll get notification of when these new videos are up. So that might be a very good idea for you to do. It will save you time. Now, the rest of this video is about the methodology I'll be using pretty rigorously to find and understand the clues to read to set text, in other words. Now, I'll be returning to uh, this methodology, this slide, in fact, and adding to and refining the methodology as we go along. But to start with, I'll be using the six categories you can see on the screen before you. And their varying relationships are fundamental to the whole set of lectures. You really do need to take note of them now, therefore. Text, time, detection, archive, game, and reader. While the individual meanings of these six terms are important, the interrelationships between them are even more important as how they relate to each other will change the meaning of each individually. What, for example, is the relationship between a text, time and detection? Can we read a text at all without thinking about time? Can we identify what a clue is without reference to, say, an archive, which tells us what a clue is likely to be at all. Can we detect and read a text simply as a game, or is there something else involved as well? Now, these are just some of the questions we can ask about the relationships between these terms. Now, this isn't a place to explore all the possibilities. What I'm doing here is simply alerting you to these six terms so that you will be aware of them in what follows. They'll return again and again and again. Now, you can also, of course, use these six terms as a checklist in your own analyses of texts you can make your own detective readings. Have you thought, for example, about the nature of the text that you're studying? And we're not just talking about the text on this course, but any text in real life or elsewhere on the degree programme. Have you thought about how the text is organised in terms of sequence, that is, in terms of time? How much do you read need to read suspiciously like detective and how much can you rely on the text to tell you the truth in other words how much do you yourself need to play the part of the detective as a reader what do you need to know to understand the text what archive do you need to have access to in order to assemble the clues or as i say identify what the clues are in the first place and then again, are you, as a reader, being played with in some kind of game? Or is the text treating you straight? If it is a game, then what kind of game is the text playing with us? And then, who is the intended reader? If it's not you as you, then who is the reader? And what clues are there in the text that tell you what kind of person that reader is? Now, these are all questions you can and should ask of any text, not just detective fiction or those discussed in the videos. This is a general life skill that we're talking about here. And I think that's really, really important to remember throughout and to suggest the general applicability of what I've been talking about, I'm going to transition into an initial discussion of Poe, not via detective fiction at all, but via poetry. Yeah, it is a bit bizarre, isn't it? But the critic Britta Martin suggested over a decade ago that we need to link the dramatic monologue with detective fiction not least because they arise at around the same time, sort of late 1830s or early 1840s. As you know, 
Dramatic monologues are poetic forms whereby a character presents themselves to the reader in the first person. The most famous examples are by the Victorian poets Browning and Tennyson. You might already know Browning's My Last Duchess. I certainly studied it at school. It's a monologue by a duke who, if we follow the clues, we find murdered his wife, his last duchess, though he's never explicit about this. In order to read dramatic dramatic monologues and decode them, we have to read them suspiciously. We have to ask ourselves constantly if the monologuer, the narrator, is actually telling the truth. Now, we'll certainly find quite a lot of examples of narrators who are unreliable in the set texts. But Britta tells us that her students often find dramatic monologues difficult. They find it difficult because it's left to them to infer information that the kind of narrative they're used to, that is prose narrative, provides as a matter of course. Readers have to guess situation and setting with dramatic monologues. They have to guess who the characters are, what the relationships between the characters are, and indeed what they did. How did the Duke murder his wife, for example? British students see dramatic monologues as alienating, as off-putting. But why? Is it the text itself that's hard? Well, not all students find such texts difficult. And then crime and detective fiction also depends on the detection of clues and relies on unreliable narrators as well. And yet these today are mass market popular forms of literature. Does the difficulty lie in the nature of the reader? Does the question of difficulty lie with the class of the reader? Ooh. Does it does the perception of difficulty the confidence in decoding, therefore, lie in the expectations of the reader that fundamentally derive from where the reader is socially. Heavy duty question that, isn't it? Britta says that the students who enjoy dramatic monologues treat it as a puzzle game. They have lots of fun with it. Maybe their attitude and their decoding practices depend on what they expect, and that in turn depends on their education and their social position. If they expect to be in charge of meaning, or if they expect to be able to not be in charge of meaning, but that's all right, Maybe they can enjoy texts which don't give them all the answers. It might mean perhaps that a reader who finds a text difficult might not share the same archive of knowledge that the text assumes is necessary for understanding and decoding. Does that mean that a text that's difficult is just like a case that requires detection by a super educated upper, upper class reader or detective? Well, that's what Poe suggests. Dupin in the Murders in the Rue Morgue is aristocratic and exceptionally well educated. He meets the narrator in a library, don't forget. Well, that may be what Poe suggests, but we can seize that idea by investigating our own attitudes, our own archives of knowledge, and indeed our attitudes to decoding. Britta suggests that dramatic monologues encourage us to reflect on our own reading practices. 
And that is what the detective fiction, the set texts in these videos also do, or what I'd like you to understand them as doing, by encouraging us to reflect on our own ways of understanding of the world. They help us challenge our assumptions about the world. This is what's called metacognitive thinking, thinking about thinking. And this is what I mean when I say that detective fiction is metatextual. That is, the text, the set text, or we can treat the set text as about textuality. We can treat them as texts about what it means to be a text, to act as a text. Yes, the texts discussed in these videos are or were all very popular, unlike dramatic monologues now, and in many ways they are easy to read. But they accomplish the same complex and difficult task as dramatic monologues if we let them do that. Now, all this sounds terribly philosophical. But then, as we can see, detective fiction itself starts with philosophy. You'll see here that I've highlighted the two words, the analyst and what the analyst does, disentangle. Life, so goes the implication, is a real mess. And we need a special person, the analyst, to sort it out for us, to disentangle us, to put life in order for us. Now, the heavy gendering of this, which I shall return to in the third video on Poe, is very clear. The analyst is masculine. Analysis is a masculine activity. Analysis, Poe very clearly implies, is an unsuitable job for a woman. You'll disagree, I hope, but you can guess already the gender of the implied reader, too. You can also guess, perhaps, the class and racial position of the implied reader. This is not the language of the uneducated, meaning it's the language of, someone, of a, a man who's gone through uh, a, a school and probably even university. Again, more on that in the third video. The masculine analyst thoroughly enjoys disentangling the tangles of life. But note that he doesn't only derive pleasure from the complications of high exclusive culture, from high art classical music, so-called great literature like Shakespeare or Dante or something. The analyst is, in fact, so superior he can afford to slum. He can afford to derive pleasure from even the most trivial puzzles and occupations. Indeed, isn't his analysis of the trivial a demonstration that he has power over the trivial? While the narrator, of course, through the very act of describing the analyst, is perhaps trying to gain power over him. <laughs> yes, there's a complicated tangle of power games going on here, don't you think? We'll certainly uh, come to discuss that in the sessions later on. And then the examples of the trivial, enigmas, conundrums and hieroglyphics. Why choose these terms rather than, say, the very general and ordinary mysteries and secrets? Well, it seems to me very significant that enigmas and conundrums were names for printed puzzles at the time. The analyst, by using these terms, is reading. Hieroglyphics, too, is interesting for exactly this reason. The Rosetta Stone, which enabled the decoding of hieroglyphics, had been brought to light by Napoleon's troops in 1799 when they invaded Egypt. It enabled the Frenchman Jean-François Champollion to go some way to decoding hieroglyphics in 1822 in Paris, of course, where the murders in the Rue Morgue take place. 
Now, Champollion and his uh, hypotheses were much publicised and there arose a veritable industry subsequently on decoding Egyptian hieroglyphics in the two decades after 1822. That is, the two decades preceding the publication of Poe's tale in April 1841. The use of the word hieroglyphics is then very topical. It's very appropriate to the place and time of the story. It's appropriate to the male reader who is very educated, who is very modern and engaged in the now. Now, this topicality and its function is again something we'll return to at some length in later videos. This time, principally when we come to talk about Mary Braddon's novel, Henry Dunbar, when I'll be talking about something called proximity for the first time. Now, investigation or analysis or detection, if you like, doesn't just happen. For Poe, there is a method behind it. That is a certain rational investigative procedure, a certain series of logical steps, one after another, that's repeatable like a scientific experiment. If you repeat the experiment in the same way with the same materials, you'll get the same result again and again. So the analyst works with his data. Now, to the uninitiated, what the analyst does may appear intuitive, preternatural. It may have the air of intuition, to quote the passage. That's only to those who don't understand the procedures. To those who know... And this is what the narrator is trying to show us in the story. The method is scientific, rational. So far, so good. We know all this already, I suspect. After all, explaining method is just what I've done in outlining the six key terms previously, really. I was start following Poe in this. But look at this passage that I've uh, highlighted now. Unlike scientific method in experiments, what the analyst detective has to do is in some sense become his opponent, become the object of his detection. The detective has to become the criminal, identify with them. And it's through this crossing of borders between detective and detected between reader and text, that the resolution of the story, the detection, can come about. Readers, we readers, must be willing to enter into the text and identify with characters in it in order to solve its enigmas and conundrums and to understand its hieroglyphics. But look again. For we can see, too, that this passage describes an antagonistic game between two opponents. The detective is just a better player of the game who can trick his opponent into making a mistake, seduce into error or hurry into miscalculation. How far do you think reading is like that? Do texts play games with us? Are we in some kind of competition with them? Maybe all texts set down the rules of a game, but the game and, of course, the rules will be different in each time. Maybe that's what genre is. Different genres have different rules. Do we feel when we as readers are tricked? Well, there's a bit of playing tricks on us in Murders in the Rue Morgue, a lot of it in the Red Silk Scarf. But do we like being tricked? Are we willing to pay in order to be tricked, to be deceived? Do we like being shown that the text is cleverer than us after all? That it's a difficult text that escapes us after all, even if we like it? This is just another question we can ask ourselves in the mind-expanding metacognitive aspects of this course. Well, 
I hope you derive as much pleasure as I do from bringing your analytic talents into play as we go on. Videos two and three will give a lot more detail and a lot more specific discussion on the murders in the Rue Morgue. And there's a, another longer video on the red silk scarf. But I do want to warn you that the third video on the murders in the Rue Morgue is really very horrible indeed. You may not prefer to think of such things. You may not prefer to think of the implications of our pleasure, though I would urge you to pay careful attention to that third video if you can bear it. Thank you for watching and listening. Until next time.